Good day, everybody, and welcome to our financial and sustainability reporting update. Um, now, each and every year, we do this update in May to get ready for 30 June 2024 reporting season. So here we go again. We're in May. We're nearly at the end of the financial year. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, in Melbourne, I know it's May because it's freezing cold. Um, you know, I've got my Nana blanket on my lap. I've got a nice scarf. Um, so I'm ready to go. Um, as always, when we do these monthly IFRS and corporate reporting webinars, and now also the sustainability webinars, I've got with me um, Kevin Frobers, who is a, a partner in IFRS and corporate reporting, as well as sustainability in Sydney. So hello, Kevin. Hello, Aletta. Good to be with you again. And it is roundabout in May every year that I'm thankful I chose Sydney over Melbourne. <laughs> Um, so it is good to see you again and for those of you, Aletta is actually coming up to Sydney on Thursday, Friday this week, so it'll be good to see you Aletta, um, but shall we get, get into it? It's a big day today, lots to get through. It is a lot to get through, but I'm really looking forward to see you on Thursday, Friday. Thursday evening we have a nice dinner planned and then on Friday Kevin and I are running a carbon accounting masterclass there in this BDO office in Sydney. Um, so super excited about that. So looking forward to see you, Kevin. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past and present. And we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, Kevin, I've just realized that my scarf and my glasses is color coordinated with this beautiful slide. Um, Let's say that it was planned. <laughs> um, so today's agenda. Today we've got um, 13 items, basically 12 sections where we provide an update to get ready for 30 June. And the 13th one where we want to talk on how BDO, how Kevin and I and our teams at BDO can assist you. Um, so we'll start with a very important update from our regulator. So we'll start with an ASIC update. Um, and then you can see there, we look at a number of items, um, the consolidated entity disclosure statement, hot topics in the profession, um, sustainability update, because we know that's important for 30 June uh, 24, um, classification of liabilities, et cetera. So you've got all the items there. So that's what we'll be running through. As you know, this particular webinar is the webinar in the year where we schedule it for 90 minutes and not 60 minutes because there's so much to discuss. Um, and even in 90 minutes, we struggle to get through all the topics. So we've ordered it that the first topics um, are the most important and the ones we want to discuss in detail. The lower topics we've addressed in the past, for example, we had a very specific webinar on the classification of liabilities as current or non-current. I think that was in February. So there was an hour webinar on that. We're not going to repeat all of that. Um, we'll just give a high level flyover. So the new information at the start, more repetitive information, but a completeness assessment towards the end of the webinar. Um, and very important, we won't go over the 90 minutes. Uh, but just a warning, this is a 90 minute one. Um, then I would love to invite you to our Carbon Accounting Masterclasses. We had the first one in Melbourne on the 10th of May. Uh, a lot of fun was had by all. Uh, the feedback has been amazing. And um, the next one is Friday in Sydney. Uh, next week, I'm actually in Brisbane with the Masterclass. And, we all, and I'm also going to um, uh, Perth on the 31st of May. Um, then in June, we're doing a virtual one-day workshop and we'll try and make it interactive so people don't fall asleep. But some people said we can't make the face-to-face. -face. What about a virtual one? Um, due to popular demand, we will rerun these masterclasses towards the end of the year. I think at this stage, a lot of people are saying it's perfect. I want to know. I want to get started. But others have come back and said, Aleta, you're just a few months too early for me. Uh, I just want to get through reporting season and then I'll do the masterclass potentially in November. Um, so we'll circulate those dates um, shortly, but please reach out, please join us, um, really great fun. Um, also, we have our monthly IFRS and corporate reporting webinars. Obviously, 
um, this um, one, the red one, is important for 30 June. And then next month, we're looking at recent advancements in financial instruments. Um, there's been a lot of discussions, new EDs, IFRIC decisions around financial instruments, around power purchase arrangements, around derivatives, around hedge accounting, virtual power purchase arrangements. Um, so it's not a, a new standard yet, but it's on the horizon. There's a lot of new thinking. So we'll explore that in our June um, webinar. Um, if you look at the sustainability webinar series, uh, you might want to get your sustainability people involved in this. It would actually be really good if finance teams, CFO finance teams and sustainability experts at your organization attend these webinars together. Because Kevin and I are finding that maybe our biggest role is to translate between finance teams and sustainability people because they come from a slightly point, slightly different point of view. Both come to this with great passion and want to advance the course, but maybe we just have to translate and get everybody on the same page. So maybe watch these webinars together. You can always watch the recording together if you so wish. Um, so this month we talked about carbon accounting, um, or sorry, last month in April. This month we'll talk about setting carbon targets and developing a decarbonization strategy. Now, <laughs> very important, before you can think about targets and before you can think about a decarbonization strategy, you need to know what your baseline is. And not just scope one and two, your baseline across all three scopes in order to identify what is material and what you should try and decarbonize. But that's just the two series that I wanted to flag. So if we go back um, to the purpose of today uh, and looking at an ASIC update, um, so our regulator this year has been really early. Usually the ASIC focus areas come out towards the end of June. And in this situation, um, ASIC actually have issued their focus areas for 30 June financial reporting um, on the 15th of May. So, you know, they brought it forward more than a month. Um, and they changed the way they look at these focus areas. Um, so they said, um, there are four enduring focus areas. So these are the focus areas that we've seen for years and that we've talked about for years. So it's about asset values, it's about provisions, it's around subsequent events, and it's about disclosures in the financial report and in the operating and financial review, which is part of that director's report. So those areas have always been there, and I think they're kind of flagging, it will always be there. But then they've said in a second part on the right hand side that they will, on an ongoing basis, flag additional items that they think is particularly relevant uh, for the upcoming period. So there's the ongoing items on the left and the additional items that they've highlighted. In this year, they've highlighted four items. Um, they talked about previously grandfathered large proprietary companies. They look at lodgement with ASIC, um, so audited financial statements of registrable superannuation entities. Uh, they talk about climate related risks and they talk about the requirement for the consolidated entity disclosure statement. Now, Kevin, it's interesting when you look at these ASIC focus areas and in particular the right hand side, those topics align very nicely with what we've already put in our presentation before we found out what the focus areas were. Um, so when I look at the ASIC focus areas, I thought we'll do it at a fairly high level because Kevin, I know you've prepared to look at them in greater depth a bit later. So it's, it's, it's early um, and it is, um, you know, it's, it's structured in a slightly different way. Really important for us that all organizations, not just listed, but all organizations that prepare and lodge audited financial statements with ASIC, not just listed entities, should be across all these items. So really important. So let's start the session with a view from our regulator. Um, so let's look at asset values. I just want to move this a bit. If you look at asset values, um, a lot of the discussion around asset values is around impairment of non-financial assets. 
Um, so they reiterate, reiterate and they remind us that we must conduct an annual impairment test for goodwill, indefinite life, intangible assets, and intangible assets that's not yet available for use. Um, so those intangible assets that's not yet available for use, you'll see it in your financial statements as capitalized development costs, right? So those capitalized development costs, um, that it's, it's not an intangible asset that you can roll out yet, but you're capitalizing it, it's, meets, it's, it's met the threshold, it's no longer research. Um, but those capitalized development costs have to be subject to an annual impairment test until it's ready. Um, then also you have to ensure that impairment tests are conducted for non-financial assets um, if there are new or continuing indicators of impairment. Um, we often get asked the question, do I test every asset for impairment? And we say, no, you need an indicator of impairment. Um, or it could be that that indicator of impairment is still present. Yes, then you have to do an impairment test. So in the first bullet point, certain items you have to do it annually, whether there is an indicator of impairment or not. And it's goodwill, indefinite life, intangible assets, development cost. Other assets, you'll do impairment testing only if you've got an indicator of impairment. Um, then also um, make sure that the key assumptions that you've used to determine the recoverable amount of these assets are appropriate. So we make assumptions to come up with recoverable amount. A recoverable amount is the higher of our value in, um, in use. Um, or fair value less cost to sell, but that recoverable amount, you know, are we happy that these key assumptions are appropriate? Um, also, ensure the valuation method for the impairment test is appropriate, it's reasonable, um, and supportable assumptions are used. Um, and the other thing is that your calculations should be cross-checked with reliable, for reliability against other methods. So it's not as if you come up with one method, you stick with that and say, this is it, end of story. Is there an ability to ensure reliability by cross-checking assumptions, information, et cetera? Um, then the, very important, market capitalization is not considered an appropriate method for determining fair value. However, it may be appropriate uh, an appropriate indicator of impairment or used in that valuation cross-check. So you can't say I'm going to use market capitalization in order to determine my recoverable amount in some way or form. No, 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 it can be a cross-check and a cross-check only. Um, and then when we perform these valuation cross-checks, um, an entity may compare its ratio of market capitalization to revenue to that of other entities. So there can be a lot of different types of cross-checks, but we need some kind of cross-check. And then um, estimation uncertainties must be disclosed along with any changed key assumptions. So estimation uncertainties is some kind of sensitivity analysis um, or a probability weighted scenario analysis. Um, in order to support valuation or impairment. So when we talk about asset values, a big part of what we talk about is impairment. Um, and the other thing that's not on the slide that I think is really important is to consider cash generating units and appropriate cash generating units. Um, again, that could be a, a problem area. So the regulator is reminding us that asset values is important. It's important to look at impairment of these non-financial assets and then additional guidance on the kind of expectations on what we should be looking at, what we should be documenting, what should be included in position papers before the auditors arrive. All right, really important. Um, then if we look at still at asset values, but we look at values of property assets, um, you know, factors that could adversely affect values of commercial and residential properties should be considered. So, for example, changes in the office space needs of tenants. Now, we all know at the moment 
um, a lot of people are working from home and you know although the workforce um, the number of people in the organization might have increased our actual need for office space might have decreased and this is happening across the board so what does that do to the value of your commercial property um, what about online shopping shopping trends um, you know these days a lot of people only go to the shopping center for the experience um, so there has to be a lot of things at the shopping center to attract people um, they maybe try on clothes look at different sizes etc and they go home and they do an online shop so do we need the big store with all the inventory there or do we need a smaller space um, that has some samples um, and, and, and then, you know, what does that mean for the value of that commercial property again? Um, recently, I went uh, on a trip to the Gold Coast with my mum and we went shopping. And one of the stores we walked in, um, they were a um, fairly small store and they had clothes, um, you know, just around the sides, but they didn't um, have available every color so they would only have different sizes and different styles so one style one size you try it on you like the style you write the size is appropriate and then you can differently or separately select a, a color or a fabric which is a kind of different way of doing it in the past you would look around and one size one style will be in a lot of different fabrics um so that was kind of the um the quite the most extreme I've seen it um, and then you know you can order online and they'll ship it to your house so again what does that do to commercial property values um, the future economic or industry impacts on tenants um, financial conditions of tenants and I, I can't help to throw in there also the expectations of tenants that these buildings have to um, have a certain neighbors rating certain energy efficiency um, so if you look at commercial properties that don't meet those requirements that tenants might be looking forward in looking to um, in future what does that do to your values um, also if you look at the values of property assets there are quite complex leasing accounting requirements as we know um, including in payment of the lessee's right of use assets and we've we've often talked about that um, so important, as you know, that from a lease accounting perspective, you know, we've got experts across that we can help and we've got some tool to assist as well, BDO lead. So value of property assets, they've specifically called out. So if you own property, you can see ASIC is, put, ASIC is putting that on the radar. And then there's also expected credit losses on loans and receivables. So this is looking at loans and receivables, um, which are financial instruments. So those ECL. Um, it's interesting when I saw this one pop up under asset values this year, um, because we've had a lot of conversations with um, other professionals as part of our BDO global community, other countries, um, or, or IFRS experts in other countries, and then comparing their experience with what we've seen in Australia. Um, and I'm thinking, all of these IFRS experts in other countries have told me that their regulators have really placed a lot of emphasis on expected credit loss models and building appropriate models in compliance with IFRS 9. <laughs> um, so it's not an incurred loss model anymore, it's an expected loss model and you need quite a sophisticated model in certain situations. And, and, and I know that a lot of our colleagues um, in BDO UK, BDO Canada, BDO South Africa have developed tools that they can assist clients with this. And we've not seen a similar uptake or interest um, from clients and entities in Australia. And we've always thought about it. Why is it? And some of the things we thought is maybe because there wasn't a real push from the auditors, from regulators. And so with that as background, here they have it, expected credit losses. Um, so again, when you've got significant loans and receivables, um, <clears throat> have you considered a model 
that's appropriate under IFRS 9. So appropriateness of key assumptions that you've used to determine the ECL and are they reasonable and supportable? Um, maybe the need for more up-to-date information of your borrowers and your debtors' circumstances. Um, what about short-term liquidity issues for some borrowers and debtors? Um, maybe an update on their financial condition and earnings capacity. Um, another big one, receivables aging must be accurate. A big part of an ECL model starts with putting your receivables in different age categories. Um, the assumptions must be forward-looking um, and the, 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 the entity cannot simply assume that recent debts are collectible. So you can't say if it's 30 days, we'll receive it. And the forward-looking is interesting. So if you look at the recent um, budget announcements in Australia, uh, in Victoria, um, what the Reserve Bank is saying about changes in interest rates, the data coming out about expected inflation, um, unemployment rates, all of that, not just about the past, but what we expect in future should be factored in. Um, remember, past models and experience may not be representative of current expectations. Um, so we, we have to be forward looking. Maybe again, we need probability weighted scenarios. So we talked about probability weighted scenarios when we looked at impairment of non-financial assets too. Um, important, disclosure of estimation, uncertainty and key assumptions. Now those words we've seen on previous slides again, estimation, uncertainty, key assumptions, please disclose those. And then a specific call out to companies in the financial services sector um, should have particular regard to the impact of, of current economic and market conditions and uncertainties on ECL. So we need to consider um, whether there's been a significant increase um, in credit risk for particular groups of lenders, um, adequacy of the data, the modeling controls and governance around ECLs, and disclosing uncertainties and assumptions. So here, I would like to use the opportunity Kevin and you and I have talked about this multiple times. Why are entities not looking for assistance across ECL models? You know, we've got these tools available. Our global counterparts have tools that we can roll out in Australia, um, but it's just not a need in Australia. Um, so I really think this is something to put on your radar. Are you ready for ASIC to come and look at your expected credit loss model? Do you meet these criteria? Are you ready for the auditors? And please call out if you need assistance. Um, and then the last one under asset classes is around financial asset classification. So if you look at your financial assets, financial instruments under IFRS 9, have we appropriately classified and, and subsequently measured them as either amortized cost or fair value through other comprehensive income or fair value for profit and loss. Um, and you'll remember we did quite a bit of training of this way back in 2019, 2020, when this first came in. Very important to be able to justify when you end up in the different categories, because when you're in an appropriate category, the measurement is just the next step. If you're in the wrong category, your measurement's wrong, right? Because you're in the wrong category. Um, and then, a call out that a financial asset can only be measured at amortized cost because that's where everybody wants to go. They don't want fair value, right? They want stability. So you can only measure a financial asset at amortized cost if two things, the assets are held in a business model whose objective is to hold the financial assets in order to collect contractual cash flows. So you're going to hold it. Your business model is to hold it and collect contractual cash flows. And the contractual terms of the financial asset give rise on specified dates to cash flows that are solely payments of principal and interest on the principal amount. And so there's no profit component, basically. It's only principal and interest. Now, these two criteria sound simple. Uh, but you will remember from previous presentations, it's quite complex. We've got some good publications and articles explaining this. Again, please reach out if that's a problem. If you look at the value of other assets, you know, 
yes, a call out on inventories, remember lower um, of cost and neutralizable value. And if you look at the value of inventories, it includes including whether all estimated cost of completion and costs necessary to make the sale were considered when you looked at neutralizable value, um, whether it is probable that deferred tax assets will be realized. Remember, you only book a DTA if it's probable. You book all details, but a DTA is only recognized if it's probable. If you don't book it as a, as a, as a number in the financials, you at least disclose it. Um, and also some difficulty and the importance of determining the value of investments in unlisted entities. So that's all around asset values. If we look at provisions, um, th they talk about entities should consider the need for the adequacy of provisions for onerous contracts, leased property make good, mine site restoration, financial guarantees given, and restructuring. Now, there's a lot in that. Um, and recently, we've seen some media releases by ASIC where they've picked up issues, and that's why they're raising it. Provisions for onerous contracts. Remember, there were some changes on how we look at onerous contracts um, and what we should consider as part of the cost. Um, we have to look at, um, you know, with leases uh, that make good provision. When we did the transition into IFRS 16, I think we've picked up that a number of entities um, did not recognize a separate make good provision. It's a separate provision to the lease liability under IFRS 16. And there's a question around what do we do with the credit under IAS 37, but also what do we do with the debit under IFRS 16. Mine site restoration, absolutely. At the end of the life of that mine, what do we have to do? What would be the cost? When do we book it? Um, and then financial guarantees, obviously given, um, and restructuring. How do we measure financial guarantees and how do we recognize it and restructuring? So when is the right time to book a restructuring provision? And usually when you've created a valid expectation to the parties involved, <coughs> so it should be announced. Um, subsequent events, it's a, it's a general call out. Um, entities should review events occurring after the end of the reporting period to determine whether those events are adjusting or non-adjusting events. So between the date, the reporting date and the date that the director signed um, the director's declaration and the auditor signed the audit report, what has happened? And these things that's happened, is it adjusting? Is it, a, is it further clarification of something that already existed at reporting date, even if you only know about it now, but it did exist at reporting date, or is it brand new information? Again, that can be a little bit tricky from time to time. And then the final point that ASIC has raised is a broad point across disclosures in the financial report and in the operating financial review. Now, the operating and financial review is a section of the director's report. Um, and some uh, entities have it, uh, a separate disclosure in the annual report as well. But ASIC has a real clear expectation about these disclosures. Um, whether you list it or private, doesn't matter. These are the kind of disclosures they expect to see in your financial report somewhere. So they say the OFR should complement the financial report and tell the story of how economic and market conditions have impacted the business results and prospects. So not just historical prospects. Um, the overall picture should be clear, understandable, and supported by information that will enable investors to understand significant factors affecting the entity, the business, the value of its assets. Um, explain the underlying drivers of results, financial position, risk, management strategy. Again, the word, future prospects. Um, all significant factors should be included um, and given appropriate prominence. Um, and then the most significant business risks at the whole of entity level that could affect the achievement of the disclosed financial performance or outcomes should be disclosed at a whole of entity level. The OFR should discuss 
ESG risks, the sustainability risks, disclosing an exhaustive list of generic risks that might affect many entities is not helpful. And these risks should be described in context. So it's not these are all the risks that could potentially hit any organization. We've done a risk assessment, climate risk assessment for our business. And let's explain why the risk is important or significant. What's the potential impact of the risk? Um, and where relevant factors that are within management control. Um, important climate change risks could have a material impact on future prospects. And these risks need to be disclosed. So they make it very clear. You have to, talk, you have to disclose business risks, but there's a separate call out for climate change risks that have to be disclosed. And then cybersecurity risks could have a material impact and require disclosure. For example, a loss of personal data or denial of service attacks could have could impact revenue. So I think if you look at it, there are disclosed significant business risks, but there's a specific call out for climate change and cybersecurity risk. And cyber security part of broader governance risk. And obviously climate change a part of broader environmental risks. So these disclosures particularly called out. So what they're saying here is it doesn't matter that we've got mandatory climate reporting in June 2026. It doesn't matter that we have a two-year delay. This is the disclosures we expect to see in the financial report in the OFR. Yes, Mandatory reporting would be a separate sustainability report in 2026, but in the next two years, this is our expectation. Um, remember, the disclosures in the OFR is not subject to auditor assurance as such. The auditor will read it to make sure there's no inconsistency with the information in the financial report, but there will no, be no specific auditor assurance opinion on it. Um, then we, we give you a bit of a summary of recent ASIC enforcement media releases. So to date, I've just talked about ASIC's focus areas, what ASIC is saying on the 15th of May, what they'll be focusing on. This is looking back over the past 12 months and say, what has ASIC done around enforcement? Um, there's failing to lodge financial reports under Chapter 7, IFSLs. Um, there's grandfathered large private companies um, that didn't lodge proper general purpose financial statements, including no comparatives. Um, issues around agent versus principal, and <coughs> that was around software reseller, the greenwashing by a fund manager. Um, there's failing to lodge five annual financial reports, a um, number of years. Um, there's improved disclosure of unbuilt disbursements and disbursement funding interest. Um, there's a, fail, a failing to lodge annual and half year financial report uh, or hold AGMs, have the minimum number of directors, including those in Australia, have a company secretary. Uh, so you can see, you know, some um, quite a bit of fines there, 36 companies prosecuted. And then also, a lack of business risk disclosure in the OFR, including climate risk and cyber, so broad business risk. Um, and if you want to read more, uh, let me just go back, yes. If you want to read more about this, um, and throughout our presentation, we have a slide where we link to articles that we've written. And you'll see that ASIC Focus Areas article is already live on the website, but the newsletter is only going out tomorrow. Um, so we, we discuss the focus areas um, and we, we discuss some of these media releases and lessons we can learn from that. Um, Kevin, at this stage, I think we've talked enough about ASIC. Let's go over to Consolidated Entity Disclosure Statement for Public Companies. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Aletta. And it's interesting because every time Aletta and I do this webinar, we always look at things ever so slightly differently and start to unpick what we think the underlying causes are. And Aletta, while you were doing that section, I think it's becoming really clear to me what ASIC is actually doing. 
um, they are starting to drive change in the organization, moving financial reporting away from annual compliance at the end of the year when you're preparing your financials. And they're actually moving towards an integrated approach towards accounts preparation, modeling, forecasting, and risk. And I could actually sort of pick the themes out while you were talking. One, they want entities to be all over their contracts, understanding their obligations, their onerous contracts, what their provisions are, what, what their ongoing future commitments are, linking that to an ability to forecast and model out their prospects. That word's gonna come up a lot more in the future, prospects. Prospects yeah. means essentially, you know, <laughs> what's coming in the future and what you're going to be able to generate in terms of returns, let's say. But prospects is the things that impact that. So that's business risks, risks and opportunity and so forth. And then articulating that in your financial statements. And I can see it linking because if you're unable to link your contracts registers and obligations to your modeling, to your risk register, it pops out in your financial statements really quickly because as it can see, if you can't disclose your business risks or you don't have a handle on your asset value or you don't have an, a handle on your provision, what that tells them is your underlying accounting and reporting systems are unable to link to risk setting, risk and opportunity and to the board. So that's what they're doing and that's what they're challenging organizations do to, to do in the guise of um, these changes or these focus areas. But they're also, and this is where I'm heading towards consolidated entity disclosure, they're starting to move us towards a new set of annual reports. Now, this particular section, I'm gonna spend a bit of time on. And the reason for it is it's, it's quite a fundamental shift in the way you prepare your annual reports. And it's actually not the last time they're gonna do this because the letter later on in the presentation is gonna start talking about sustainability reporting and mandatory reporting. And what you'll see is, there's another change coming to the way the structure of the annual report is going to look once mandatory reporting comes but let's treat this particular section as the first gambit of restructuring your annual report and it's effective for 30 june 2020 uh, 2024 financial so jumping into it a letter and a letter's driving the slides today um very silently Government have been starting to change transparency in the way financial reports are generated or produced, linking to things like risk and forecasting and so forth. And one of the changes for public companies in the current year is what's called a consolidated entity disclosure statement. Why the change? Because I'm sure you know government has had this bee in their bonnet lately about multinational companies and tax. So the idea of this is one of the initiatives to start to enhance security, uh, scrutiny, almost said security, scrutiny of multinational companies and how they structure their tax arrangements. It's a small change, but it's designed to have big impact because what it's going to do is require in the current year, 30 June 2024 annual reports, public companies, which that's listed and unlisted, to make certain disclosures about their subsidiaries and their subsidiaries tax arrangements and where those, those subsidiaries are registered and formed for tax purposes. So that's happening this year. So I think this is a big change. It's why I'm gonna spend some time on it. It's legislated already. Royal assent was given on the 8th of April. So it's happening. It applies to financial years beginning on or after 1 July 23, which basically means 30 June 24 annual report, which is why we're talking about it today. And, and here's the kicker. This statement will require a director's declaration over it. Similar to a director's de declaration that's given for financial reports, you know, every financial statement needs a, need, needs a director's de declaration about um, true and fair, but this director's declaration is slightly different. It's a true and correct declaration. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the, in, in the presentation, but what it basically means is directors are going to have to not only make these disclosures in a new statement in the annual report, but they're also going to have to give a direct, the director's declaration over it that actually gives assurance or certainty that they are signing off that the information in that statement is true and correct. And what that means is it's a lot more um, 
onus on directors to accept that the information in there is correct. Under a true and fair declaration, which is what applies to financial statements currently, you get to hide a little bit behind materiality. True and fair means it's materially correct, but a true and correct hurdle is more than just materially correct. It actually requires accuracy and precision, meaning you need to make sure it's right. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be repercussions. That direct uh, declaration also extends to CEOs and CFOs for listed. So there's not just directors signing off, but CEOs and CFOs are signing off in the case of listed entities, that this the, uh, statement, this consolidated entity disclosure statement is true and correct. Now there's a lot going on there. For those of you who are on, on the, come, uh, on the, on the, um, the present, uh, this, uh, the, 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 this webinar today, your ears should be pricking up because this is happening now. It's happening for 30 June 24. For unlisted and listed public companies, it requires a director's declaration over a new statement, which requires true and correct, which means you need systems and processes in the organization to make sure this information is true and correct, that you can actually have certainty that the, direct, the, direct, the director's declaration over it is actually able to sign off and actually have comfort that what they're signing off is true and correct. And enlisted entities, CEOs and CFOs are signing a declaration as well. Lots going on here. I, I think we should also acknowledge for all our attendees that this is a raging debate in the profession at the moment. So what is the difference between true and fair and true and correct? The one thing I think everybody's in heated agreement is true and correct is a higher hurdle than true and fair, that we know. Um, and we know true and fair, there's a concept of materiality lurking. However, true and correct, does that mean no materiality, right? And, and that question is keeping a lot of people up at, uh, up at night. So it, it's a debate, definitely true and correct is much higher than true and fair. Um, and we'll keep you up to date as the conversation progresses. I know there's also been some uh, pressure put on um, regulators um, th that come up with this requirement to, to articulate. So what does true and correct mean? And maybe the, um, you know, the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, you know, what does true and correct mean? So we need some guidance. We haven't seen anything yet, but, you know, it's it's a debate. Yeah. And interestingly, on the next slide, we'll see what's actually required and you'll start to see what they're trying to do. And I always say in this scenario, um, if you're leaning into what does true and correct mean, maybe you don't have to worry so much if the information that's required for disclosure you already have and you know it's, you know it's correct. If you don't know whether the information is true and correct because you're worried that it's accurate or precise, Maybe that's the point of the regulation because they're trying to say it's a bit murky in the world of tax and tax structuring. And if you're not comfortable that the information you're disclosing about subsidiaries and their tax jurisdiction, then maybe that's the point is to try and make inquiries to make sure you are certain about that information. Let's have a look what this looks like. This is, I'm gonna spend a bit of time on the slide. So the financial report currently is embedded in the annual report, which has financial statements and notes. And we generally today already have a director's declaration that covers those. So, so in the red blocks, you have financial statement notes and currently there's a director's declaration over those, those financial statement and, and notes. Where does the consolidated entity disclosure statement sit? Well, we're, we're suggesting it sits just after yeah. the notes, but it's not a note to the financial statements because the notes to the financial statements and the financial statements are covered by this true and fair concept, whereas the consolidated entity disclosure statement is covered by the true and correct concept. What is required in the consolidated entity disclosure statement? This applies to essentially entities that have subsidiaries, and what you need is the subsidiary's names, whether that subsidiary is a body corporate partnership or trust, whether that subsidiary is a trust, trustee of a trust partner or any sort of participant in a joint venture within the consolidated group. If it's a body corporate subsidiary, where is it incorporated? This is the fun stuff, because if it's not incorporated in Australia, where is it incorporated? Now, legitimate trading companies in other um, countries is great, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that what they're after here is 
companies that are subsidiaries that are set up in tax havens. That's one of the objectives of this disclosure. And then it gets further into it. If it's a body corporate, in other words, a subsidiary has share capital, what percentage of the share capital is held by the company that's making the disclosure? And then we start getting into Australian resident and foreign resident tax disclosures about those subsidiaries. And then if it's a foreign tax resident, the various foreign, foreign jurisdictions um, that were the resident for tax. This is all at the end of the financial year. So you, you're making disclosures at the balance sheet date, essentially. But you can see here, there's a lot more information mm -hmm. required about your subsidiaries, shall we say, and where they are registered, where their tax jurisdictions are, and so forth. Kevin, We've got some FAQ. Sorry, yes, Aleta. Um, If you don't mind, um... You know, somebody in our team, the amazing Cheryl Levine, put these slides for us together. And Cheryl in originally had annual report on the left-hand side, consisting of these bits. And then when I looked at the slides, I changed it to financial report in the annual report, right? And then I thought, wow, wow. Actually, even within our team, um, and, and she's absolutely an amazing superstar, and I didn't even have time to speak to her about it, but even in our team, we have a little bit of conflict is, is this consolidated entity disclosure statement, is it sitting just in the annual report? So somewhere in the annual report, or is it part of the financial report? Um, so I've, and I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, so we've got this difference. And then interesting, attending some meetings within the broader profession, and I had another one this morning, People are still arguing about this. So Cheryl and I are in very good company <laughs> if we've got different views about exactly where this sits. And again, that's something the profession will sort out. Um, because in a way, people are arguing the red blocks, financial statements, notes, and directors declaration. That's part of the financial report and it's a package and it's all about true and fair. And therefore, it's a bit cleaner if we put this consolidated entity disclosure statement and its director's declaration outside the financial report, right? So in the end, what, where it sits, I suppose, is not the end of the world, um, yeah. but it's the yeah. detail. So, so I just wanted to articulate, not to confuse people, but to articulate this is new legislation that is coming into play 30 June. The dust is not settled yet. Um, and we'll keep you up to date. And and I think we've we've covered these on the next slide. We've got a whole bunch of questions there. Those questions are actually out of our um, article, which we have on our website. So really, what I'd actually suggest is go and go and grab the FAQ. But really, there's some questions that we've already answered. Things like who has to prepare this? It's really anybody's. Uh, any any public company that has a consolidated scenario or at least has subsidiaries. Some entities don't prepare consolidated accounts for various reasons, but if they've got subsidiaries, they'll still be required to make the disclosure. Where do we put it? As as you can see from this debate, even a letter and I'll over the place on this one, because I spoke to our investor relations director last night about this and we hypothesized whether this perhaps is maybe a schedule at the back of the financials, similar to, you know, um, yeah. top 20 shareholders. And that might be true, but the reality of it is there's a director's CEO and CFO declaration that's got to cover this, which those yeah. other annexes generally aren't covered by the director's declaration. So yeah. there's, it, it's clearly a statement of higher standing compared to the other schedules in a set of annual reports, but it's not quite in the financial statements if you're trying to kind of integrate this fair and reasonable, fair and true, true and correct type of concepts. I think, Alessia, in the interest of time, we should probably kind of push on. I think we've certainly laid the groundwork for, um, you know, the importance of this, and we'll head to hot topics in the profession. I'm going to cover that off in a high, quick, high level because we've actually covered most of those topics already and then Alessia can talk about sustainability reporting, um, um, which she's going to take today. Hot topics in the, in the profession are really reminders. Rook, we're in an, a higher interest rate environment. I mean, higher relative to what? I'm not sure because it's not necessarily higher compared to you know, the last 40 years, but it certainly is higher than it was during COVID and, uh, and, and in the pre-COVID days. Global conflicts are not going away. They're actually just transforming into something else, but it still leads us to all these issues. 
that are impacting your financial statements and how you pull them together. Some of the topics that came through during the current year are lease accounting, a letter. I think we're in the fourth or fifth wave of lease accounting. It won't go away, um, but that's fine. We're happy to deal with lease accounting. It certainly is, once again, it's a data gathering exercise. It's a process driven exercise and it links very nicely to if you don't have a system for lease accounting, that's, that's indicative of you don't have appropriate systems and, 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 and um, uh, processes in your organization to deal with it. Embedded leases yeah. won't go away. Um, Aleta? I just wanted to say about lease accounting, um, it continues to amaze me. You know, we've implemented the standard in 2019, first time reported 30 June 2020, so four years, so it's a fifth year, right? Um, some organizations are still coming to us with lease agreements that they didn't know about. So we are still four or five years later uncovering new agreements. And I still believe, everybody hates IFRS 16 and I love it. I still believe the biggest benefit of IFRS 16 is it's putting governance over contracts. It's putting governance over lease agreements because how can we have leases of significant properties that is critical to our business, but we didn't have a lease register or a proper lease register. But once we have the numbers hit our balance sheet um, the way it does currently, there's more rigor required. Auditors are paying attention. So I, I still think IFRS 16 has achieved that and it actually aligns to your comments around what ASIC is trying to achieve across managing contracts and That's addressing right. Yeah, and Aleta, I mean, we 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 can. Yeah, you know, I love having these debates, but it is true. I really, really do believe that accounting standards and financial and co corporate reporting and climate and sustainability is we're driving towards a scenario where you should be using it as a tool for better governance, better governance, yeah. better compliance, and the ability to put systems and processes in place. Honestly, one of my least um, uh, outsourced lease management clients is actually a listed entity in the financial services sector. So we're not talking a small organization and they are still in the third or fourth round of a contract identification process. And they're still finding contracts which we have to go back in and backdate those lease counts. Now, what, what that is, it's not a bad, it's not bad that, that, that they're in that situation it's actually good because the lease accounting scenario is driving a process in their business where they're actually getting on top of what have they signed and committed to in terms of leased property and leased assets and it is astounding to me how many they didn't know about and it has they've, they've essentially kind of got a whole bunch of people involved trying to get that done and we're running around in the background trying to get the lease accounting done for them every time we find a backdated change we're putting it through and and working that through so it has improved their governance around this um, and absolutely, that's what the point of this is. Um, I think on the, the next slide, Aleta, we've covered a couple of those, you know, um, times of uncertainty. We've highlighted this in terms of an IRB, which we've put out as Video Global. There's nothing on here we haven't already spoken about. And all of these things, fair value measurements, effects of inflation, climate related matter, disclosures, all of them essentially go back to this. Are you on top of your contracts? Are you modeling your prospects? Is this linked to your risk and opportunity register? And can you report this information in your financial statements? It's the same thing. When it comes to risk and opportunity registers, liquidity risk, market risk, credit risk, things like energy prices, supply shortages, ongoing wars in the Middle East and in Ukraine, they all drive the impact on an entity's risk and its prospects. So factor that into your models, make sure that you're getting your asset values right, make sure that you're reporting this in your financial statement and disclosing it in your OFR. That's pretty much the, the takeaway there. And then I think on the next one, I because I couldn't help myself, I put an impairment testing slide in because as all you know, a letter lives and dies by lease accounting and I live and die by impairment testing. Those are our two sort of favorite topics in the whole wide world. Um, if your impairment models are not factoring in the new accounting standard for leases, IFRS 16 or AASB 16. The industry or the profession is moving there quite rapidly. Um, we were accepting models that were a hybrid between the old method and the new method of accounting for leasing, but really auditors are putting their foot down, regulators are putting their foot down, and the reason for it is you actually do get a different answer depending on which way you go. And the correct method is actually to accept that leasing 
is a financing arrangement. It impacts things like your financing, your discount rates, because you're essentially leveraging, and you do need to incorporate include incorporate those right of use assets in your CGU for impairment testing because otherwise you end up impairing the, the wrong asset, especially goodwill. If you don't include right of use asset in your impairment models, you often get the wrong answer when it comes to actually taking an impairment right down and often the casualty is goodwill and no one likes to write goodwill down unnecessarily um, in their impairment models. Um, as with all our other sections, there's a couple of links we've given you to the resources, um, and I'll leave it at that because a letter just before 12 o'clock, I think it's time we talk about the big topic of the day, which is sustainability. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I have to tell you, I so much love doing these webinars with you, not just working with you, but actually doing these webinars. I love it. Thank you very much. Just so much fun. Um, sustainability update. Um, why are we talking about sustainability? The question is, I have to tell you, um, over the last three, four years, I've been working three, four, five years, working on sustainability. And uh, Kevin, I don't know if you remember, last year, November, I was quite depressed. I said to you, Kevin, I am working on sustainability and I'm speaking to everybody, but it's as if I can't get any traction. I'm doing my very best here. What's wrong with me? I can't get traction, right? And fast forward six months, I'm saying to Kevin, it's exploding all around us. Everybody wants to speak to me every day, the whole day about sustainability. Um, so, you know, so Kevin often reminds me, Aleta, please don't complain. Six months ago, you complaining, you know, that you couldn't get traction. You now have traction. So my question is, and I've been saying to Kevin, you know, so why now? Why is everybody talking about it now? Why, why is it off the, off the Richter scale? Um, and there are two reasons. Strategically, people are realizing there's certain things we have to do as, at, around sustainability. Um, strategically, we need to act. Um, so that's a big move. And the other thing is the compliance imperative. Some organizations have realized if mandatory sustainability reporting is coming, if that compliance burden is coming, you know, we've got le final legislation tabled in parliament, everybody's talking about it, the AASB is finalizing standards for Australia, et cetera. You know, we have to get on board and this is not something you can do backdated. So for most organizations, I'm actually happy to say that they look at it from a compliance and strategic perspective um, but for a lot of smaller businesses so group three entities and i'll talk about what that means but group three entities or small businesses not even lodging audited financial statements with asic are looking at this from a strategic perspective so the compliance might never ever impact them but strategically to stay in business and to ensure they've got future prospects Kevin, of future opportunities or they manage their risk, um, you know, they look at it strategically. So it's off the charts at the moment, thankfully. Um, I don't have to be depressed about this anymore. Um, so if you look at that strategic imperative, the strategic imperative goes hand in hand with voluntary reporting in a separate report or strategically you might decide that i don't need to do a separate fancy sustainability report but what i do have to do is i have to measure and report my carbon footprint or i have to measure some key measures that my customers investors etc are asking for so strategically who are my stakeholders what information do they want what information are they now asking for um, and how do I get ready to respond to those information requests in an efficient and effective way, which might not be the fancy report, it might be some kind of other alternative. Um, so the strategic imperative really is about how do I keep access to capital, debt and or equity? How do I keep access to my customers and my markets? How do I keep my customers? If customers are asking for certain sustainability related information, I need to give it to them. 
And then how do I ensure that I keep people working in our business and attract people to work in our business because they want to align with a business doing the right thing and looking after sustainability. So I think this is something that um, we've pushed out. I can't remember whether it's a year or two ago. We've developed this sustainability roadmap. I think it was two years ago where we said, if you look at this from a strategic perspective, um, this is how to tackle it. You have to assess what you currently do. Very important step two. You have to do a materiality assessment, which is a fancy word for stakeholder engagement. So let's do stakeholder engagement to identify what my stakeholders want. Not all are created equal. You don't have to speak to them. You can review their published documents so you can see what they're committed to. There's different ways to do it. In step three, compare what we have, what we need, identify the gap and how we're going to respond and measure. And step five, don't have to be a fancy final report. I actually have to update this roadmap. It can be a fancy report or it could be some form of informal reporting to my key stakeholders. Um, and then how do I continuously improve that? So this still holds true. So we help a lot of clients on this journey. Um, so strategically, what do people need and how do I respond to that? If your focus is compliance imperative, and hopefully it's both strategic and compliance, but if it's compliance imperative, you would be thinking, mandatory reporting in the annual report. Now, this comes back to what Kevin has talked about earlier. How is the structure and the content of the annual report changing? Um, so we know globally, we've had two standards, IFRS S1 and S2. So IFRS S1 is saying, do a materiality assessment, identify who are your stakeholders, engage with them. Um, and S2 is looking at climate disclosures. Now, this is new information, hot off the press. Um, to date, the Australian Accounting Standards Board have suggested that they're going to mandate only IFRS S2 in Australia. Treasury has been on that bandwagon, final legislation, climate-related disclosures. So in the AASB's exposure draft, they said, basically, forget about S1. We're just going to focus on climate. And BDO have put in a comment letter, and many other entities have, where we've said, hang on, we cannot make the same mistake with sustainability disclosure standards in Australia that we made with the adoption of IFRSs in Australia in 2005. Because if we start to tinker with global standards and we cannot automatically comply with Australian and global standards at the same time, you know, no good a problem because on the accounting standard side we unwound all of that by 2009 can we save ourselves some time energy and stress and just get it the same from day one and um, the double asb has indicated in a recent um uh, discussion that they've got strong feedback um that they shouldn't deviate from these standards and they're actually considering to bring IFRS S1 into the Australian market on a voluntary basis initially and mandate S2, but at least keeping and acknowledging that these are the two global standards and that many Australian entities anyhow have to comply with the two global standards. So, to, so make it easy for them and that going forward, you can mandate IFRS S1 as well. Um, so I think that's fantastic. Um, I, I just cannot see Australia going alone on this. Why on earth would we? Are we working so hard to get the US, Europe, everybody on board with the ISSB? Why would we go our separate ways? So that's exciting. Um, the, 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 where it links with what Kevin was talking is that in Australia, uh, Treasury have said that in the annual report, we want to create a brand new separate a report and that's a sustainability report. So this sustainability report is completely outside of the financial report. It's a sibling for the financial report. And you need assurance over this report, which should be provided by your financial report auditor. So the same firm. So we had draft legislation with those things. The double ASB came out with this ED, which I hate with a passion. 
uh, because they made a dog's breakfast of IFRS S1 and S2. So I'm hoping they're stepping back from this ED significantly, to be fair. Um, and then the final legislation um, actually just said, we will, we will provide relief uh, to group one entities for at least six months, because how can we mandate reporting if we don't have the final standard in Australia and everybody hates that EED, um, similar to me with a passion, um, and we don't have final audit standards and independent standards. So yes, we've got at least another six months. So we've got the final legislation. We still have that ED. They're telling us they'll have an Australian standard um, you know, equivalent to IFRS S1, S2 by August. And I have to tell you, having worked in standard setting, the only way they can do that if it's basically the same as IFRS S1, S2. So I'm saying, bring it on, keep it the same. So this is talking about the group one, group two, group three entities. Group three entities are all the entities basically already preparing and lodging audited financial statements with ASIC. So this new requirement to restructure the annual report and have a separate sustainability report with climate disclosures um, will impact every entity currently lodging and preparing audited financial statements with ASIC um, in, in coming years. If you are not preparing and lodging audited financials with ASIC, <coughs> mandatory climate reporting might not be coming your way, but strategically, you might have to calculate your carbon footprint and report your carbon footprint and report it uh, to uh, your customers um, quite shortly. Um, this final legislation has provided some guidance that <coughs> depending on when the final legislation goes through parliament, what the potential effective dates would be. The bottom line is if you've got a 30 June year end, we are now looking at the earliest possible date is 30 June 2026, not 30 June 25, which is great news because Kevin and I have been hoping to get work. And now that the work is landed and all landed at the same time, um, it would have killed us to get all entities ready for 30 June 2025. Now we have more time so we can work out a more reasonable roadmap to get you ready for 30 June 2026. If you've got a 31 December year end, you are a, a key priority for us because you already have to report by 31 December next year. So the 31 December year ends will go first, smaller cohort, and then the June year ends um, will go next. Um, so coming back to that structure, Kevin, they're talking about an annual financial report annual sustainability report, director's report, auditor's report. Um, interestingly, and you can see the sustainability report, the structure is very similar to the structure of the financial report. The million dollar question is, this new list of subsidiaries and consolidated statement of subsidiaries and tax registration, where does this fit in here? Because in this legislation, even Treasury talks about these four reports. And although the other legislation has gone through parliament, it does, it's not already reflected in here. So does it sit within that annual financial report or does it sit between the annual financial report and the annual sustainability report? Not sure. Not the end of the world as long as it's there, uh, but I just want to flag that's kind of structurally where this is going. Um, if you are thinking, you know, if you go back, that sustainability report, um, what exactly goes into that sustainability report? What does a climate statement look like? You have to comply with IFRS S2 or the Australian equivalent, which is hopefully the same. Um, Kevin, you'll be happy to know that the very first thing you have to do is disclose your governance and your governance um, out of those charts with governance level or board level, as well as a management level. So that's the starting position. Then you have to look at your strategy so what are your climate related risks and opportunities? Uh, what are your physical and transition risks? What effects do these have on your financial statements potentially in future? How resilient is your business model and your business and your strategy to deal with these risks and opportunities? And by the way, they are articulating here the strategy around climate. They assume that your business already have all of this in place for all other business risks. So this is just another risk that has to be part of governance, another risk to be part of your strategy. And if you look at risk management, we're not saying 
create a climate risk register. No, no, no. Do a climate risk assessment. How does this Im impact your enterprise risk register? Um, how can we do the same processes to identify, assess, prioritize? Um, one of the key things is actually how do you calibrate your other business risks and your climate risk? Because surely your enterprise risk register won't have 17 climate risks or 20 climate risks and 20 other business risks. There has to be some calibration across your whole business. What are the key risks and opportunities? Um, and how do you do that? And then we look at climate-related scenario analysis. Again, at least three scenarios. Again, how does all of this integrate it in a risk management process and register? And then after you've looked at governance, strategy, risk management, you finally get to metrics and targets around carbon footprint and targets and how you're going to measure it and whether you're gonna use carbon credits. Now, I just wanna say, if you're a small and medium-sized business and you don't care about IFRS S2 because you don't have a compliance obligation, but you've got a strategic imperative because your customers need certain information, you might focus on metrics and targets because that's what your customers and your investors want strategically, right? Um, always good to consider holistically governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. Kevin, something I, you wanted yeah, to add I'm here. Burst, I'm absolutely bursting out of out of my <laughs> excitement. Uh, what I actually wanted to say was exactly what I said at the beginning, and you already repeated it. But just I want to really put this out there. Asex focus areas are, I believe, not necessarily only focused on the current year and asset values and provisions. They really are trying to move entities towards setting their systems and processes up in order to identify the prospects, model those out financially, link it to risks and opportunities, and report it in an annual report in a structured way. Even if you haven't yet identified your climate-related risks, as a letter already said, you should have systems and processes that allow you to take your financial information, model it into your impairment and asset values, link it to your risk and opportunities, and then present it in your annual report in a certain way. It's rinse and repeat, and then overlay climate, overlay biodiversity, overlay human uh, capital, and all these, essentially all these, these things that impact on a business's prospects. So really my, my takeaway from today is, Make sure your entity has the right processes, systems, modeling, and link to business risks so that you can start to essentially overlay climate and all the things that are going to come next because you're going to get left behind. And that, to me, is the takeaway from, 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 from today's session. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and then important is to not look at climate risks and opportunities and sustainability information in isolation. The reason by elevating the sustainability report next to the financial report is to ultimately achieve integrated reporting. So how does sustainability information impact um, the financial report? So I think it's, if, if this is an extract from the, the TCFD recommendations. I love this diagram. It's pulling it together so nicely. The other thing I have to say, um, a lot of people have said, listen, if I'm looking at it from a compliance perspective, it's been delayed for a, a few years or let's say at least six months. So what do I do for FY24, FY25 financial reports when this is not um, mandatory yet? Now, number one, strategically, it might be still really important to do all of this because your customers, investors, everybody's asking. So, you know, strate consider strategically whether you can delay. But even if you think strategically you can't delay, I want to remind you of this. And that is that the chair, the ASIC chair, um, had a, made a presentation on the 22nd of April where he said that we have to start prepared now for mandatory climate disclosure regime. And a whole speech, and you can read the speech, I've, I've put a link there to the speech. I've got a few extracts here, and you can see I've got my highlighter out. Um, Nearly 75% of the ASX 200 have committed to already voluntary reporting climate information against the TCFD framework. Now, I know the TCFD as an organization has been disbanded, but the TCFD have disbanded because they've now joined as a member of the ISSB 
that creates and establishes IFRS S1, S2, etc. Um, so the framework is still alive, it's still there for adoption. Um, and that framework forms the foundation of IFRS S1 and S2 and all future st standards because the TCFD came up with the concept of governance, strategy, risk management, and then fourthly metrics and targets. So ASIC is steadfast on its support that for FY24-25, until we get to mandatory reporting, at least comply with the TCFD framework. Um, I think what's important is the TCFD recommendations and framework. If you put that in FY24-25, where do you put it? You would put it in your operating and financial review, right? It's not a separate fancy sustainability report subject to assurance yet, right? So it can be part of your director's report. It can be part of the OFR. It doesn't need audit and assurance yet, but please have it in. Please consider it. Uh, and at the same time, consider a gap analysis on how we get to IFRS S2. Again, you, there's only 11 recommendations. You don't have to do all of them this year, but how do we work towards doing all of them in the next year? The other thing is that in the ASIC focus areas, um, they've articulated again, before mandatory climate reporting, ASIC encourages companies with material climate related risks to provide voluntary climate disclosures in accordance with the TCFD recommendations. So these recommendations, part of the OFR. Um, I think it would be very difficult for any organization to argue that they don't have material climate related risks and opportunities. Um, you know, I think if you think you have no material climate related risks and opportunities, I would say sit back, let somebody do a climate risk assessment for your business. Uh, let Kevin or I do a climate risk assessment for your business and we think again, um, because climate is spreading through the whole economy around decarbonisation, et cetera. So these are the 11 recommendations. Um, in FY24, do as many as you can. <laughs> Identify the gaps you want to address to fill in in FY25. And then another step up in FY26 when you get to IFRS S2. So it's a continuous improvement journey over the next three years. So we've got a TCFD checklist. Um, we've got some training to help you. So start with TCFD, get it in FY24-25, and then we work to IFRS S2. So next steps. Um, so this is a roadmap, best practice roadmap for group one entities. Um, but at the moment, when I'm speaking to group two, group three entities, they are saying a letter, Yes, we're not group one, but we want to follow this roadmap because there's a strategic imperative for us to follow this roadmap um, because our customers, our investors are group one anyway, um, or whatever strategic reason. So you can see the three streams we've got is there's two compliance streams. I've broken the compliance streams into two because carbon footprint is such a major thing. Um, and a lot of entities, even though they don't have compliance obligations, have a strategic need for that carbon footprint measurement. Um, another compliance stream across the compliance climate related disclosures, those two streams together um, would meet the requirements of IFRS S2 potentially. But again, you start with TCFD, then you do IFRS S2, then you consider Australian sustainability reporting standards. And the last stream in yellow, is more the strategic focus. So who are our stakeholders? What do they want? Um, if it becomes voluntary or even mandatory, it will um, translate into IFRS S2 whenever that may happen. Um, but it's not a compliance imperative. It's voluntary at the moment. It's, it's about strategy. Um, so again, please reach out if we can help you with any aspect on this uh, roadmap. Kevin and I are running really hard to help our clients get ready for this. Um, Kevin, over to you. I think from a time perspective, we've got 10 minutes left, Kevin, and luckily I'm, we've told up front that we'll be going fast. So you've got 10 minutes to go as fast sorry, as you can. Let, let, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Now, from this point forward, it's speed dating. What that means is <laughs> it's actually homework. Um, so those of you who've joined us traditionally on these webinars, Aleta and I 
kind of throw lots of content at you. The idea behind it is the information towards the back is stuff that we've either addressed before, there's an article available. And so the point in the next, shall I say, eight minutes is I'm going to point out some high level pieces. A letter is going to drive the slides. I'm going to kind of say bits and pieces along the way, and I'm sure Alessa will, 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 will have one or two things to add, but I want to try and get to the not-for-profit sector section for Alessa to give a very high-level overview of not-for-profits um, at the end. I'm going to do it in eight minutes. Let's go. Classification of liabilities. We did a webinar on this on the 24th of February, very detailed. This is not necessarily effective. For 30 June, but you're in the comparative year. So if you're doing 30, 30 June 24 disclosure, you're going to have to actually make a, dis make a disclosure whether your classification of borrowings between non-current and current changes. Now, non-current and current classification changes has huge impacts on covenants and so forth of things, but the classification between current and non-current liability is now being driven by covenants, breaches of covenants, rights of rollovers, and all of these concepts are now rolled into the accounting standard. There's a great decision tree we have in our publication, the publication on the screen at the moment, and on the next side there's a decision tree. And what this will help you do is to decide whether your liability from a loan arrangement actually meets the test for current or non-current depending on how it interacts with covenants, whether you've met covenants at the balance sheet date or before, whether you've got a right of rollover, whether there's waivers or periods of grace included there. But what's really interesting here is a lot of this stuff was sort of diversity in practice before. Now it's in the standard, there's a very detailed guide, and you may actually find that the way you classify your liabilities is different come next year when the stand is effective, but you will also have to restate comparative, which may mean that you've actually got to disclose that in your current financial year, because you may be doing a non-current liability at 30 June 24, which when you restate next year is actually going to be reclassified to current, and that might impact, I don't know, loan covenants and so forth. Long story short, detailed webinar on the 24th of February. There's a detailed guide out there, and reach out if you have any questions. Now, standards effective for the first year, speed dating, a letter, let's go. What's effective in the current year or for 30 June? Insurance contracts. I feel like we've been hammering insurance contracts for some time. This doesn't only apply to insurance entities, it's any entity that has a contract that qualifies as an insurance contract. So essentially, you know, insuring against a non-financial risk, let's say. That's in. And if you haven't started to address that yet, and there's a possibility you have that sort of contract, get on that right now. You need to make sure that's applied. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work has been done in the insurance sector on this, but as we always say, not all insurance companies are the only ones who apply the standards. Some entities are actually providing insurance over non-financial risks. They're not insurance companies, and this standard applies to them. Um, please make sure you've addressed that if you haven't already looked. The other standards effective this year, and just kind of looking at all the writing on the screen right now, accounting policies, estimates, material, um, uh, 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 material accounting policy notes versus, versus significant accounting policy notes. I don't think there's anything here we haven't dealt with on a previous webinar or in a previous uh, concept. So I'm going to say a letter. We'll just point out that we've given you some self-read slides. You can go and have a look at it yourself. Um, and there's, uh, I mean, there's actually a lot of content there. The, the, the key takeaway from this is if you haven't yet started to clean your financials up by removing decluttering and boilerplate disclosures and making your accounting policy notes read better, you probably haven't applied any of these standards yet. So that's probably the trick. If your financials are still 400 pages long because you've got reams and reams and reams of accounting policy notes, you probably haven't had a look at these financial state, th th those particular standards, and this is the first time they're effective. So get in there, muck about a bit it, and make your financials more readable. Um, in terms of pillar to income taxes, it's a hard thing to actually talk about. There's lots of slides in the back of the slide deck on this, but it really boils down to this. If you're an Australian entity or group with more than $1.1 billion worth um, um, in your revenue, consolidated revenue, and your effective tax rate is less than 15%, this is once again one of those multinational tax um, initiatives. This might impact you. Where are we? There's draft legislation that is currently in the mix. It's still it's still a bill. It's not yet legislated, if I recall, which imposes top up top top up top up taxes on some of these entities or the entities that essentially 
um, apply. I want to say if you don't know that this applies to you yet, there's a serious breakdown in your tax compliance governance framework because I would imagine if you're operating in a world where you have more than $1.1 billion worth of AUD revenue and you don't know there's a potential top-up tax um, coming to to, uh, uh, to affect you because your effective tax rate is less than 15%, you, there's a breakdown in, in, in the global tax compliance. Um, but this is still a bill but there's an interaction between the tax legislation that's lurking in the Australian tax legislation as well as the way this gets disclosed in the um, income tax accounting standards, which is AASB 112 or, or IAS 12. If it applies to you, I think the idea is look at what we've put in the slide decks and reach out if it doesn't make sense. That's probably the way to go at this point. Four minutes to go, Aletta. Um, in terms of where we are in slides, I've already spoken about these. These are the slides that we've given you um, access to, accounting policies, um, deferred tax on, there's the pillar tax, it's all yeah, this is kind of self-help, I'm saying speed dating. This is meant to be, go and read this yourself if it applies to you. Um, where are we up to? Half year financial periods. I think some of the same standards probably appear here as well, a letter. There's the liabilities, current non tagged supplier finance arrangements. I, we've spoken a lot about that and we have some articles there. I don't think we'll deal with it, but we do have slides here if you've got a 30 year, 30 June 24 half year. Standards issued not yet effective. These are standards coming which aren't effective at 30 June 24. The big ones are. In, in, in this one are really things like primary financial statements and IFRS 18, the look and the feel of your essentially um, your, your, your profit and loss and other comprehensive income is going to change. Big change actually, this is very much a presentation change, but it's really going to work something like this. You will have to classify your items in your profit and loss based on investing, financing and income tax and dis discontinued operations first and then the line items that are left after that will be operating. What currently happens is there's this mad scurry about putting everything in different places in, in, in profit and loss to try and report EBITDA, normalized profits and sometimes interest is operating and sometimes interest is financing. The new standard effective in 2027 which is IFRS 18 will hone in on how you classify items in profit and loss and it really boils down to you start with investing, uh, financing, tax and discontinued op and the, the rest is operating and I do think it's going to have a fundamental shift in the way we present. Do you need to do anything around, about that? No, but let's just put this in the bucket of your annual report and the way it's all getting presented is changing. Not only is the Australian regulator changing everything around in terms of new climate statements and you know um, subsidiary disclosures, but also the actual profit and loss itself is going to change, and it's going to make make normalised profits and EBITDA and all those sort of adjusted profit numbers align with the way entities talk about it in um, you know corp, 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 corporate announcements. Those were actually the ones I wanted to talk about a letter. Um, I think in terms of lack of exchangeability and recent Africa agenda. There's a lot going on there with one minute to go. Um, I think we'll leave those a self-study unless you want to deal with any specific letter from your side um, because I wanted you to actually have a go at not-for-profits um, before we ended. Yeah, so we've got a lot of IFRIC agenda decisions uh, for people to have a look at. Again, you know, not all relevant for everybody. There's articles. Um, if you're uh, uh, registrable superannuation entity, there's even a section for you as well. Um, there's more financial reporting obligations from 1 July 2023, which means 30 June 24. So again, it's for a small niche part of our attendees, but please look at that and if you need help, let us know. Um, hyperinflationary economies, if you're dealing in some of these countries that are potentially hyperinflationary, are you applying the right standard? And then if we look at not-for-profit entities, really what I'm trying to do here is just say that we are running a specific not-for-profit focused session on the 4th of June. So this is a, a session that will be presented by the national leader of um, not-for-profits, Anthony White, but also Nick Kirvin will join talking about privacy. Um, and cybersecurity for not-for-profits, it's a big issue. I'll talk about a financial reporting update for not-for-profits, financial education, 
um, and Oliver Stryker will talk about investment policy assistance and investment assistance for not-for-profit. So please um, join us for that. And how BDO can help, um, again, we've got our partners that you can reach out to and we'd love to help you. And um, this is our broad team. We're incredibly proud of our broad team um, that's growing. And, and by the way, we're going to be advertising. I think Kevin is already advertising. I'll also be advertising. We're looking for uh, great minds across IFRS and sustainability. So please join our team, reach out. Um, we've got our regular insights, um, our corporate reporting insights going out tomorrow, sustainability news on Friday. Um, you can join our, or we'll look at our learning hub for IFRS and sustainability. Um, and I think finally, I would say, Kevin, thank you very much for presenting again with me today. Can't wait for dinner on Thursday and a great masterclass on Friday. Everybody take care. Have a great month. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.